a good teacher and a great teacher and a great school would go, what am I teaching? How am I teaching it? How can I integrate technology to make that lesson better or enhance it and stretch and challenge? Not, I've got a device, how can I use it to teach? Today I'm here with Philippa Raithmel and in this podcast series of CEOs and founders, I wanted to ask her about her company, Eruption, which works to bridge the digital divide that exists between schools. It's no secret that I'm a huge advocate of digital transformation, so I wanted to ask her what caused her to create Eruption. So Philippa, can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about what you do? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I am Philippa Raithmel. I am the founder and CEO of Edruption. Edruption is something that I guess I have been kind of plotting and planning a way at for some time now. Um, there, from my perspective, and, and I'm sure you'll see it as well, there is so much that needs to be done in education in terms of digital learning and technology. And there's such a, a lack of understanding around it. And when I first went into technology specifically in terms of leadership roles i found that there wasn't just it wasn't just one thing it wasn't just having devices there was safeguarding there was policies and then also really importantly there was this divide between adults and parents in terms of understanding like even myself i remember when i was asked to do the job and i was like but why 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 do they need devices what do they need the the ipads for and and i was thinking you know because i basically went from secondary school when i came to the middle east i taught through school and i started teaching year two year three year four um so it was a whole new experience and it was incredible I actually found out that i quite liked teaching small children um but it was i was kind of like why do they have these devices what do they need them for and, and really quickly realized that actually they need them for the world that they're in now. And we just didn't have them when we were growing up. And if we had had them, we would have needed them too, because we need to understand the skills and the transferable skills and to understand how to utilize them in the best way, not only to stay safe, but also to be able to actually use them to be creative or to be able to be productive or to be able to just do their job more effectively. Um, and so from my perspective, it was really important as well then to kind of make sure everything was very relevant, very real world. Um, and that's really where I started. And that what I wasn't seeing was that being replicated in a lot of places. Um, there, there was a lot of teachers who would sort of say, but I don't, you know, how do you do it in your school? Because it's not working in our school. And a lot of that came down to no one really telling people why they were using it and no one giving anyone any information about it. And so seven, eight, almost years later, I kind of decided that it was about time that I went on my own and tried to help more people. Um, so one of my big projects that I'm trying to, to, to put, get off the ground at the moment is called Digital Clusters. And the idea of that is that actually you know, you don't need to have this incredibly expensive digital strategy. You just need to have someone to guide you through it. And working together as a cluster or a community of different schools, we can help each other and we can do that together. So instead of kind of me going into one school and saying, this is what we're going to do, and then maybe going into another school, and then they're still very isolated, is actually coming together. And, and that, again, is that bridging that divide and trying to be able to build those bridges. And, and I think that's just really important to be able to slowly and with really good reason help to educate our educators on why it's so important. That's right. I, I think that's fascinating. Well, I, I want to pick up on a few things there. First of all, I, I really commend the fact that as uh, you know, the, the founder and creator of Eruption, you did so you, from having identified a need. You saw that, that there was a need of, you know, for this to exist because it, was, you know, it wasn't happening and teachers were, you know, it's teachers had devices in the classrooms, but they weren't sure what to do with it. And secondly, I love the fact that you're connecting schools because it's always a case of, um, you know, the, the, old, the old trend was don't tell anyone else what you're doing and just keep it in-house so that we can stay you know, outstanding in relation to Ofsted, but everybody else can be good or, 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 or below. Yeah. But, you know, that's, not, that's really doing a disservice to the young people because, you know, we're there to serve them. So... Shouldn't we all be working together for all the young people who are the generation of tomorrow? 
if we keep pretending that it's just ours, then how are we ever sharing best practice? And that's surely what we're meant to be doing, exactly as you said, because we're serving these young children. Another thing that, that I absolutely love doing, actually just last week was doing a big project with a school where we encourage them actively to bring other schools to the event because the idea is it spreads that word it says look we're using technology really meaningfully and this is how like we want to send you home with the skills i had one teacher who was there from a different school who he said actively said he was like i've i've put off going to any of these events it's my last week in the middle east and i was like fine i'll take some kids he said i wish i'd been before i can't believe that events can I can be inspired by an event as well as the kids and that the kids didn't, you know, they've learned something. They've come away from this with so many different aspects. They just wouldn't have learned if they'd stayed in school today. And that's what it's about. Like, is that spread? And then he'll go away and go, I can do more. I could, and then I could even come back to those people and say, can we do something together or shall we work together? Or, or can I borrow that? And, you know, can, can I see if I can work on it in a different way? Amazing. And that's really what it's about. It's not that kind of, this is mine and I'm going to hold on to it as tightly as possible. Nobody grows like that. And it's like, almost like, like, you know, if you think of nature, it's like seed dispersal, you know, and yes. that's what we should really be doing, isn't it? When it, when it comes to these ideas. So um, I attended a conference. Um, I delivered a session actually at a Qatar Foundation um, international teaching conference. And so I Amazing. was talking about digital transformation. Now, I thought I knew what I was talking about, right? I was talking about Microsoft OneNote and using it to get students to have digital copybooks. But someone in that session was using Google Classroom and they, had, they were using other applications. So they put the hand on my head and said, can I demonstrate how I'm doing this? And I said, yeah, brilliant. So they came up and they shared what they were doing. And so it was a two-way process. And I went away as a session, you know, session uh, leader with something that I didn't have going in. Likewise, the attendees went away with ideas that they could try out in their own classrooms and that's only by connecting you know if we work in, in silos as if we think think of a school as a silo this is our silo mm -hmm. and that's it that's a silo it's not my problem yeah yeah but absolutely that doesn't, that's not that's not that's not it, good practice that it really isn't and then and also like for instance from your perspective if you move to a school that's google you'll go oh okay i know i can do what i do i used to do but i can do it here Whereas I'm sure you'll have, have noticed when you go to different schools or when new staff come into schools, what we love to do as teachers is go, oh, yeah, that's great. But what I do is this. In my last school, what I used to do is this. And I've now changed jobs so I can do the same thing that I was doing in my last school. Yeah. And actually, they don't want to learn what, what you're doing or they don't want to wait to see if it's, it's as good or better. And this is the whole thing as well. Like, so my book was all based on this idea that there's a digital ecosystem and the safeguarding surrounding a digital strategy is built around the fact that we select different things for our school. So for instance, your school, if they're a Microsoft school, the more of that that you choose to utilize, the better, because that means that everything is safe. The more people add and bring all these things in without anyone knowing about it, the more data gets lost, the more information goes out there that no one really has any understanding of that trail and that, that kind of what we potentially could click on and then have a cyber attack and all these different things. And there's so much that goes around it. But ultimately, like we need to as teachers as well, come into schools and go, I'm here and I'm listening to what you're going to tell me that is right for your school. And I want to work for your school. So I'm going to assume that you're going to suggest things that are the right things for the students here. And it's so important. But and those different meetings and times, because there'll have been people sat in your session going, oh, I'm a Google school. I wonder if I can even do that here. Am I going to have to get Microsoft? And that sharing of knowledge is, is vital. I want to ask you then, Philippa, how does it work? What does eruption do exactly? It's such a good question. Definitely bridge the digital divide. We are a company that supports tech for good. Um, and when I say that, it's because there is such a strong narrative globally around negativity towards technology. You'll see across the world at the moment. Techno fear. Yeah, absolutely. But you'll see schools banning mobile phones and then they don't have devices inside the schools. And it's like, well, hang on, let's take a step back. Who gave them those devices? So one of the things that we do at Eruption is we do a project called Digital Bridge. Digital Bridge is parent workshops and it's parent workshops because, again, when I was at my first school doing my first um, digital transformation, the biggest loophole was us, was parents. I have two children and I had to learn how to put restrictions onto their devices. I had to learn 
my own things like you know actually i can't just stand there with my phone out all the time and i need to listen to my children and there's seven million apps available for smart devices that didn't exist 10 years ago seven million apps the number can just be overwhelming and it's not just apps that parents have to worry about there's also texting screen time and social media mike yeah question is so how do you avoid losing your kids to technology project workshops are all about being able to do little things that help to support having a, a balance of digital tools within our lives and using technology for good in our homes um, and supporting our children to grow as these digital natives and then so then the next level is using tech for good in school so making sure that the digital strategy is strong but also covers four specific pillars so you have your digital governance which is all of the things surrounding policy who can use what who can choose what who can do who can make those big decisions and also your infrastructure and you know the kind of how is it all being managed etc and then you've got your safeguarding which is obviously around all of those platforms and also integrated into the other policies how are we making sure that we're safeguarding our environment and then you have the all important thing which all teachers want to do which is the teaching um and how we actually build that in and how we don't just pass over devices and go here you go learn with it we actually go this is what we're doing today and in one lesson it might be i'm going to teach you a skill but in another lesson it might be we're going to use it as a transferable skill because i know you know it and now we're going to use it in a different way so you end up sort of building this really big array of skills that they can just utilize in anything. Um, and then there's obviously innovation within that as well. And then the final pillar is, is innovation. And for me, it's really important for schools to remember as well. They look at all these other schools, don't they? And they're like, I want to be like them. I want to be like them. But actually every school has their own niche. They have their own needs. Like for instance, accessibility is so important, but nobody really values it in terms of what devices can do. Let this be a lesson to you. Always keep your room tidy, or you might trip over your model solar system and sprain your wrist. Which is a bit of an issue because I'm supposed to write a book report tonight. Lucky for me, my laptop has accessibility technology. See, I'm using speech-to-text software. So, whatever I say, my laptop writes it out. Accessibility technology allows people with a wide range of abilities and disabilities to interact with technology. It's important for technology to be designed for everyone because when we include everyone, we all succeed. It's about making sure we're looking at our own demographics and what we're doing and not looking at every other school because innovation for, for one person's school might be ensuring that every child has accessibility features switched on because it's new and it's different for their school. Not new to the world, but new to them. For another school, it might be flying helicopters around and, you know, landing drones and, and that's great, but we're not all at the same pace. So we don't need to pretend that we are. We just have to be innovative in our own area. I love the fact that uh, as an eruption, you're, um, it's a whole school initiative and not just whole school, but also mm. incorporates the wider community, you know, and the idea of school is becoming more flexible now and including parents and carers, you know, we call it our school community. And I love the fact that you're trained because a lot of parents don't know how to use technology in the home. You know, they know how to use their own phones. Well, suddenly when you become a parent and, you know, you've got a child growing up, um, it's very easy to say, well, here's an iPad. This mm -hmm. will um, be your free nanny. And yeah. that's not a yes. very, um, yeah, and, and it is. And it acts as a nanny for a while, but... It can, you know, it can affect the child's eyesight. You have no idea the content that's out there now. And it's not educational. There's so much educational software out there, but mm. you just got to put it in front of your child. And putting the device isn't enough. You know, the, I think an education has, does have to happen with, with regard to the parents there. And you'll know more about that than I do. Um, and then you've got, of course, the school. And after the school, you know, um, senior leadership team, you've also got the teachers as well. And it is important that school has a very clear directive and a very clear direction when it comes to technology and its use. So if you're streamlining the way that the parents are um, using tech at school, in their homes, which the child can access, and then you've got the school and then you've got um, the teachers as well, I think that whole school initiative will really create... Um, Absolutely you know, many will, will allow, you know, young people to benefit in many, many uh, positive ways. Mm, absolutely. And I think it, it gives everybody clarity. If your school is driven by a vision and a mission around their use of not just technology, learning in, as a whole, because learning technology shouldn't really be separate, it should be integrated into everything. And as you mentioned, it is every stakeholder. 
that's involved in that. There's no one can stand there and go, oh, I don't, I'm not dealing with digital technology. That's not me because everybody uses it for their work. Do you think it might be useful for schools to incorporate um, technology in their vision and mission in some way? You know, it's such a carefully worded statement, isn't it? But I've always found it centers around learning, but perhaps schools could consider, you know, as we head into the future, um, adding an end so that, so that it's, it's like, um, it's like a beacon, isn't it? It's like a signpost that, you know, you know, schools who were a technology school. Well, but in what direction is your school heading when it comes to technology and its use? I think so. I think when I see technology school now, I think of like engineering and an actual like technology as opposed to what I think people see that as, as like digital strategy technology. I think digital should be embedded so much that you just don't even really like realize it's there. It just works and happens around you. And actually, from my perspective, I would I would always say, don't add it on as a tagline. Don't say that we're and digitally whatever, because actually there's an expectation. Part yeah, of your DNA anyway. You wouldn't go into an office and start working for a company and then not expect you to be able to be using digital tools. And, you know, there would just be, a hand, here's your laptop, here's your email address, off you go. And there's that assumption um, that you know how to do that. Whereas actually in schools, we need to sort of build that in. And I think maybe we also... Uh, you know, this idea of retraining the teachers, a lot of us, or at least when it comes to myself anyway, my training was about 15 years ago I trained as a teacher. That was a long time ago when it comes to technology. Technology has come such a long way in a very short amount of time that I could tell you that my training when it comes to technology is quite irrelevant now. You know, we were told that there's going to be a staff printer and you begin an email address. I think that's, that's about it. Um mine was as, as much as sort of saying i'm using the interactive whiteboard in my lesson that was my computing it's like what digital what are you doing digitally oh i'm using the interactive whiteboard incredible and i wasn't even using yeah i'm i'm top, top of my game i've gone from the chalkboard exactly to using that interactive whiteboard with uh you know back oh, in my days it used to be an overhead go. projector but i'm you know cutting edge now <laughs> with that interactive it, whiteboard they... And my PowerPoint slide, it's like... But we don't, learn, we don't learn about it in PGCs. You have to do a master's in technology education to be able to learn anything about it. And then I remember being in my PGC and it was like, well, it's sort of potluck as to which school you get. You might get a school that's really tech savvy, you might not. And they literally said that in one of the sessions. It was like, you might be really lucky and you might get someone who's got lots of investment. You also might have a school that doesn't have anything. And so it just depended where you went and you didn't have a kind of base. It wasn't, there was no kind of every school must. It was just, you do what you can. And so, we're, but when, yeah, we're now in a position though where that's not okay. We've had a pandemic, everyone needed to get online. The pandemic taught us that it's not okay. And the school leaders were like, oh God, what, where do we go from here? And yeah, it was, a, it was a baptism by fire almost because we had to go on Microsoft Teams, online learning, and the students weren't ready, nor were the schools, nor was the education itself. It wasn't ready for the pandemic so if the pandemic was anything that we have to future proof our students and the sad thing is that people went back to school and they went oh we've had so much of this we're just not going to use it and parents had such an influence because they'd seen bad not not across the board but they'd seen bad technology use in the pandemic because it was done quickly it was done in a brash way it was done to survive actually if they understood that a good teacher and a great teacher and a great school would go, what am I teaching? How am I teaching it? How can I integrate technology to make that lesson better or enhance it and stretch and challenge? Not, I've got a device, how can I use it to teach? And actually when we start to look at it from a pedagogy side, then actually what we see is that teachers are doing things to be able to support children in the best possible way or to be able to get a learning outcome out of them that they possibly couldn't have done before but parents don't see that parents don't understand that side of it and i think especially i know in in the uae parents are quite quick to question what teachers are doing and and actually like not necessarily you know you wouldn't go into a doctor's and, and nor a surgeon's and be like oh you <laughs> not sure you should be cutting that bit out <laughs> you know and but yet they're really happy to come in and say well I don't know whether why are you doing that and like I don't I don't think that's a good way to teach it's like well hang on a minute I please respect me as a professional the reason I'm doing it is for the best for your child 
and not just because I fancy it. And I think there's, there is a level of that as well. But I also think that that's where the balance between helping support parents to have their own vision and values at home, but then helping the school to align their vision and values with their technology use. So for instance, if you say you're an innovative school, then you need to be being innovative with technology, right? If you say that you're a, I don't know, a global citizenship school, how are you using technology to ensure that your students are global citizens? So there's, there's really easy ways of being able to balance that two together without saying with technology. And so I think it's about having that real clear vision and mission. I, I, I remember during the pandemic, I wasn't keen on students, you know, a lot of teachers were doing different things different ways. So one of the things that I didn't want to do was ask them to, oh, write it out by hand and take a picture of it and attach it. I wasn't keen on that. And I, I wanted them to develop the, you know, the writing skills. So I said, you know what, we're going to, during this pandemic, we haven't got face to face, because we'd get our laptop once a week, right? So I said, tell you what, um, let's type everything, but I want to be able to see it. So I created a, a Google Docs um, for each of them. Mm -hmm. And on my page, I had all their links. So at any point, I could jump in to do, see what they're typing. That then changed to Microsoft um, uh, OneNote. But it, you know, it was slower at first, but eventually, yeah, they were, they were typing. And I said, listen, your digital mm -hmm. literacy is as important as your literacy. In fact, when you go into work, yeah. you're not going to be given, name me one job where you're given a copy book. Here you go. Here's your <laughs> copy book. Welcome to the company doesn't happen but you are told you yeah you're, you are told you're gonna have to you know produce reports and so on so uh, we had these google docs and after the pandemic a lot of um, teachers said right let's get back to our copy books thank god and i said no i'm gonna not many things not many positives came out of the pandemic but the one positive thing was was that students were introduced to using technology on a day-by-day -day basis i said i'm gonna continue that and so we kept our google docs and once a week we type the copy books then became a draft book, you know, for them to write their ideas down, for me to mark and correct. The, the master copy would then go into the digital copy book. And I said, to, and, and as the year went by, I said to my year 10s, guys, that's your revision book. Those are your revision notes right there. When you're doing Mice and Men and Inspector Calls revision, you're not going to be trawling through pages and pages that, you, that you've written by hand. It's going to be all on a, your Google Docs and it's there and it's in one place. And so. Legible as well. Legible as well, yeah, exactly. Oh, they could pop that into AI, ping out some little flashcards, and away they go. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's talking. Yeah, Elon <laughs> Musk said that he hopes that um, AI is used for the betterment of mankind. And I think if we're using it in technology and we're using it to stimulate thinking, of course it's going to be there for the betterment of mankind. I was talking to Katie Hasselstrom. Katie Hasselstrom created um, TeacherBot. It's a website that helps teachers generate resources. And she was saying the same thing Amazing. that. And as was, um, uh, there was another man I was talking to as well. And he said, uh, we have to get to students to use technology, not produce this for me, but I produce this, transform it for me. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or where could I do better? Give me some advice. How could I do better? You know, here's the success criteria yeah. that I'm giving you, AI. Here's a piece of work I created. How can I do better? How much did I meet it? Bam, and it's going to instantly create them uh, with a set of targets. Yeah, definitely. I, and especially if they're independently on, like, you know, sat at home and they don't necessarily have support or what have you, to be able to do that and get immediate feedback from something is amazing, especially if they're asking the right prompts. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's all of life is about asking the right questions. Whether we're asking them to Google a person or AI, like, realistically, how we're asking, what we're saying, how we're forming those sentences is just so key treat ai like it's a like it's a teacher you know you wouldn't ask a teacher do this for me sir you know say AI, look, how can i how can i do better you know and i and i was saying this idea of yeah. of ai being uh, you know like a computerized assistant for you it's a teacher's assistant and teachers treat it as such uh, students should treat the ai as uh, in such a manner i think well i've got a set of actual questions for you to ask you if that's okay okay go for it okay um um, so when you create, uh, as you know, I'm a huge fan of technology in the classroom, but so what inspired you um, to create Adoption? What, what was the gap in the education industry that you were aiming to address? I know you talked about um, the education of parents and the school's direction, but is there anything you'd add to that? So I think the biggest thing that I found there was a gap in, and it's something that I've worked with the government here for, with as well, which is governance. And that for me was 
within everything else we had policies and understanding about what we do as teachers whether it's to do with how we are how we use teaching and learning in our school or how we do safeguarding in our school but we have all these digital systems and not one person is in charge of them or is the person that is actually saying this is the correct thing to be using and this is what we can do with it and this is what we can't do with it so nobody had any governance and so for me the biggest gap and the biggest thing that I'm trying to fill, even though it's not the most exciting, is digital governance, because I do strongly believe that if every school has the foundations of that, they can do anything with technology because they have a clear strategy as to what they can and can't do. Yeah. And, you know, that's so important, isn't it? You know, it's so important that if left unchecked, technology mm. could just I mean, it could be on a piece of paper somewhere. It could, I'm sure there'll be a great policy on it. Yeah. You know, if you ask someone, oh, we've got, we've got a great policy on that. But how is it actually being implemented on a day-by-day basis? Because teaching is all about the day-to-day, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. On that note, I wanted to ask you my second question, which is, can you share some success stories or notable milestones uh, since Edruption's conception? Yeah, so I think one of the first projects that I worked on was with uh, the Repton School in Dubai, and I was called into them before their inspection this academic year. And really, it was just to help support some of the teachers to utilise devices and technology in a better way. And I think post pandemic, they'd lost their way a little bit. There's a whole new leadership team this year, and it was the brilliant Gillian Hammond, who was over at the Repton School that I was at in Abu Dhabi, and she called me in to help out with that. And basically it was more about just kind of going, what have we got here? Like, where are we, where are we going? And it, identifying that actually they had the tools, but they just weren't using them in the right way. So being able to support workflows. And we just had such a positivity in terms of around the training and the support, but also about the fact that they could actually utilize technology effectively in their classroom. So we did pre and post surveys. Um, And and literally 100% of teachers went from feeling like they would rather keep their devices in a drawer to actually actively using them all the time because they could see there was a workflow, they understood the tools better and they just had this better way of working. That is so fascinating. I mean, what what an achievement that is to have gone in and got that, you know, it's all about the feedback, isn't it? That yeah. 100% feedback where you've seen teachers, have, you know, we're so, we become quite jaded teachers, you know, especially when we're in, in the job a couple of years and we just think, well, hmm, and we're very skeptical of outside influence. You know, we're skeptical of inside influence too. But we're just skeptical People, of we put our guard up and we're like, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. And you're like, no, I'm not saying you are. You just just might be don't know your tools as well as you. Yeah, because no one's actually told you often. Um, yeah, and I think the other thing I would say as well is Digital Bridge, which has been like a big thing that I've been pushing this year. So um, we've been doing some parent workshops with schools and the feedback's just been phenomenal. Just people feeling really empowered to actually take control of their technology at home. A lot of people having younger children and older children, you know, sibling mix, and they've found that they've not got boundaries at home, but they're able to go home after the workshops and really feel confident to sit down and say, we're going to all sit down as a family and work out our vision in terms of technology, because as parents, we're not happy with what this looks like right now. And we know as as children, you know, you're upset with mum or whatever because she's always on her phone and you're upset with dad because he's always working. What does that look like? And so the amount of parents have, have messaged me and emailed me and said, I just it's changed our lives because we, we just felt really empowered to actually have that conversation. It is so nice. That's so heartwarming, isn't it? That you can get that from parents. And parents are so... You know, one one of the things you can't do is tell a parent how to parent. I mean, you know, the guards go up, but but as parents, sometimes we can feel so vulnerable. Like, this is something I don't know how to manage, and this is something that you know, with parents, with parenting, you always go to your mother or your father for advice. Like, how did you guys do it? But with this, we can't because technology has changed so much. And I think that's the thing with with the workshop. It's very much like we didn't grow up with this, and there are so many things changing the most important thing that we can do is one so i always talk about how we should support each other so different values and different visions at home but we're a community so if i say that my child is not allowed to do something or that they are allowed to that's my choice that shouldn't be your choice as well and as parents we need to remember 
that that's okay. Like we, there's a lot of peer pressure that goes on with parenting, especially around devices. Yeah, just as us being moms, we're constantly comparing ourselves to other moms yes. based on what they're putting on social media. I Isn't feel that inadequate. Like false, yeah. I'm like, I should it's be at the zoo. Yeah. I should be at the science center right now. I, yeah. I haven't even, you know, made 10 dinners yet like Martha Stewart <laughs> and What's meal wrong prepping. With me? <laughs> and why am I not reading five books a night? <laughs> To my sweet little pumpkin, oh. I'm telling you, yeah, it's you know. tough out there for us moms. And we just, every single day, it's a new challenge. Yeah. Oh, but such and such said, and oh, they're going to think I'm a terrible mom if I don't let them. And it's like, but you're there to parent them. And I think, so a lot of the parent workshops I've done so far have really been about saying, it's okay to have your own beliefs and say no. Um, and I think sometimes parents just need to hear that as well. I know I do sometimes, just someone to say to me, your decision is okay, like stick by it, you're okay. That's really, that's really, that's, that's so heartwarming. Because I mean, I guess back in our days, it was easier because when I was a child, the devices in the home were a Tamagotchi, maybe a Game Boy, that's about it. That was very easy to manage, take the batteries out. <laughs> With... Yeah, absolutely. Take the remote controls out, the snares. <laughs> that's the old snares control. I keep it around for, um, for nostalgia purposes. Oh my God, that's amazing. That's hilarious. That was my favorite. Like that was my favorite thing to do. Was to play well, actually, this is the like, more advanced version. Nintendo, I've, I've rejigged it and they've added joysticks here, which is what didn't exist. But apart from that, it's the same thing. So they took what existed and just transformed it. But this was the only thing. Yeah, yeah you take the controls out. You can't play the snares. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and uh, but now it's it's a whole different world. You got phone. You got forget that. You got phone games that are online. And your oh, child, know, could, left unattended, could be playing with a complete stranger across the world, yeah. talking to them through the chat devices. And, yeah. you know, I think games companies got a lot to answer. But equally, parents, because if we don't tell them no, then they're going to do it. Like, it's social media. Social media is 13, but we have children who are seven, eight, nine years old walking around with it. Someone has told them that that's okay. And a parent has given them that device. So unless we've said to them actively, this is what you're allowed and this is what you're not. It, it's no, it's not the school's fault. It's the parents' fault, really. And so I think it's, you know, but again, that comes to peer pressure because parents go, oh, yeah, but their friend had it. And, you know, that's the, and it's like, well, that's, that's up to their friend. And that's, you know, that's okay with their family. I love the idea of making your own house rules. These are our house rules, you know, and that's why I was, I was watching the Adams family the other day, actually. And one of the things about the Adams family is that they are unique. Yeah. And sometimes that's good because, you know, the way they show it is that they have their own personalities. Everybody else, they're all kind of following their own social norms and so on. But sometimes it's good yeah. to have you. These are our house that's rules it. and that's yeah. it. Clear. My third question was, um, uh, how does eruption differentiate itself from other educational platforms or initiatives? I don't know what other initiatives there are that do this, to be honest, but I thought I'd throw the question out to you. Yeah, I think... Um... There are lots. I mean, so Google, Microsoft, they all have things like parent contracts and things like that. I guess what makes Edruption different in terms of digital bridge is just the fact that we're here. We're, we're in person. We talk to people. Um, and I do think, especially since the pandemic, as much as we like to say, oh, we can self-pace learn, we can do this, we can access this course. People like to talk to people. And I think that's really important, especially when there's a barrier like technology. Um, and then in terms of... of you don't want someone saying training you up. We're going to tell you about how to use technology in the home. However, we'll be online and we'll be via Zoom. <laughs> it's like... What? Exactly. You're like, what? I can't even log on to Zoom. How do I do that? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yes, I think that's really important in terms of that. I think, you know, there are access resources all over the place and there's some fantastic resources that we leverage in terms of supporting parents with it. However, I think that that is really important, that face-to-face. -face. And then I think in terms of... of digital strategy and eruption itself it's again it, we we do all sorts of different things but my is very much like it's technology for good like empower teachers with the right strategy with the right tools to be able to teach children because at the end of the day that's what it's for everybody needs to be the person that knows that, you know they, they everyone needs to know that it's their responsibility and eruption just it allows people to be able to say you know I'm, I'm good at that, but I'm not good at that. Can you help me? And we can do lots of different bits for whatever that looks like to be able to support people to understand it. And again, that's really personal. Going in and understanding vision and values of the school, understanding the demographics of the children, understanding the demographics of teachers and saying, you know, what, actually you've got teachers here who've 
taught in 15 different types of, of school. You know, they've got IB and GCSE and, and British and American and Pakistani and everything. And then you kind of go, you put them all in one school and you've asked them to teach something they've never taught before. Well, actually, there's a whole load of information there that you need to get able to calibrate on first. And so I think a lot of the time we maybe forget that we're from so diverse. We come from so many different places and we need to align as a community. So again, I think Adruption just does does it in a way that hopefully isn't too like forceful and scary. It's very much working with people to get them to build out their strengths and to really build capacity in school. So, for instance, the digital um, clusters project I mentioned at the beginning, it's about saying to all the schools, it's like, you know, you might be great at this, but they're great at this. You two could team up together and you could really build capacity in each of the schools by helping each other and sharing best practice. Yeah, it's all, it's all about connecting is such, I'm such a fan of connecting people. Uh, I've been in Qatar for 10 years and I recently joined um, ILM Connect and ILM Connect works on just getting teachers to connect across different schools in Qatar and um, I've seen so many benefits and uh, in my chat with Dr. Martin Bloomfield, he talked from a special needs um, perspective. He said some schools might face issues that other schools don't face, but those schools might face okay. a different set of issues that this school is doing quite well. And so when you connect them, you can find that, that balance. And you know, if you get dialogue going, oh, is that how you solve that? That's actually a really good idea. And then like, and the other school might be like, well, we've, that problem you're facing, we're actually doing quite well at that. Yeah, exactly. And I just think that's so important. And for too long, we've been closing our mouths and saying, oh, but we're not allowed to talk to that school over there. And actually, why? Like, we're all in education. This shouldn't be a secret. And it's not a secret. None of the things we're doing are secrets. And it is quite funny when I guess people are really like careful about what they share with people because you just sort of think there will be someone else somewhere doing what you're doing, just maybe in a slightly different way. Um, but everyone benefits if we share. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, uh, thank you for that. My next question was, um, what role do you see technology playing in the future of education? How do you envision technology um, existing within um, education itself? And how would um, Edruption embrace those technological advancements? So I would I would hope that people really embrace it in a very pedagogically driven way so that they're really driving teaching and learning through it. Because what I want to see over the next five years is that we don't have to think about going to a school and telling them what digital governance is at all. They just know. And they have those boundaries, they have all those factors in place and what they're able to do is teach. And can you imagine even a world in five years time with the technology that we're going to have it's going to be incredible and that's why it's really important to understand how to do the teaching and learning side of it with technology because unless we're understanding even what we're doing now with te in terms of teaching with technology we're not going to be able to do that in five years time or even three years time and so it's really really important now that what people do is start to look at what that looks like as a model in their schools because the, the quicker we build up our skill set, the quicker we can then innovate when these new things come along. So what I'd love to see is, is a little bit like this push again with AI that's come through, is that people really start to go, hang on a minute, actually AI has been around for a really long time. It's just that until ChatGPT came about, I didn't know. And actually it's in six systems I use already. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use the technology I've got really effectively. And I'm going to do this, this and this, and that's what I'm going to make sure I focus on. Because then what we'll get is really useful, meaningful technology use in schools. And that's what I want to see is that you go into a school and there's no one that's been handed a device just because they finished their work early. They're not allowed to just, you know, <laughs> do whatever because they, you know, oh, they're a good boy. Um, you actually want to see something. Go on, go on yeah, your laptop, exactly. it's fine. Um, you want to see it because it's really, you know, like you want to see the excitement around it as well. And that kind of like buzz about like, can I do this with what I just learned to show it even better? Amazing. That's what we want to see, because that's what's going to be impactful for their future is the ability to say, I think I can do what I just did even better. And that will have a bigger impact. And that's where we need the world to go. So I think that's that's what I'd like to see in terms of how eruption can help. I think it someone actually said to me once you've done the digital clusters which is all about the governance piece really where what are you going to do and I was like well then there's the next bit it's the teaching and learning so there's always a next bit technology evolves but then so do the needs of people and so do the needs of schools and I think we'll just always keep on top of what's next
and be there when everyone's ready. And definitely a next step could be, um, so you've got teaching and learning and then following on from that, you've got the, um, um, the specialist area of special needs students. When we bring in innovation in, into learning like that, it, it makes such a difference to those children's lives. And it, exactly as you said, in terms of accessibility, there are so many features, like I've just written a big piece for um, a COBIS project that I'm working on with somebody, all about accessibility. And going through each Microsoft, Google and Apple and saying, right, what do they actually give to you? How do they provide accessibility features? What's the same across all of them? And which ones do things differently so that you can actually be looking as a school and going, well, actually, that one makes more sense for us because we have more students who are who are similar to those different needs. And we can maybe add on something for anyone who comes in or oh, actually, we're going to use that one because it does everything. And we've got that price point, whatever it happens to be. But having those understandings of, of what the tools on their own can do is absolutely game changing. Yeah, I'm, I'm not just for teaching staff, but for, but for support assistance as well. So, for example, I could be a TA in a classroom and I've got a student who I'm, you know, uh, who with. And over the noise of the classroom and the busyness of the lesson, I can't really read that paragraph that um, the girl needs to hear. And, um, but put up her headphones onto her text to speech and she'll hear it clear as day text to speech will be clear it'll be eloquent it will not have any distractions and she can just focus in on the sound and that's you know technology being used to help with accessibility like you said which is so important i mean in that for me because i'm dyslexic i just think it would have been so empowering when i was younger at school to have had those sorts of tools and i just think it's so important to make sure we raise awareness of those sorts of things, because those are the things that take technology being from, oh, it's a load of screen time to actually it's really empowering my child to learn and to be able to integrate and to be independent and to have agency over their learning and not just be the child who's got a disability. I think there's definitely a gap there for specialised software being created to help with um, students with different needs. You know, look, if you think back to the late Benjamin Zephaniah, Benjamin Zephaniah was dyslexic. And he talks in his, in his piece uh, that he wrote, he said, I was ridiculed at school, you know, whereas AI, it won't judge you. In fact, it'll tell you, well done, great job, let's move on to the next yeah. one. You know, and I think it'll be so encouraging because when a student can't um, understand something, they come to that lesson each time with anxiety. Oh God, not that lesson again, I'll struggle with that lesson. Absolutely, totally. And it's not fair, no one should have to deal with that at all. So, yeah. Well, we talked about inclusivity. So uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced while growing Adoption as its CEO and founder? And how have you overcome them? Um, it, yeah, it's quite scary. I think sometimes you wake up and you're like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> this is all on me. Um, I don't know. I think having my biggest challenge, I think, was becoming like a bit of a salesperson, which is not really what I wanted to ever do. But I guess you have to sell your company. Like, why should somebody want to to work with you? Why would they want to take your product? Why would they want your services? So I think that's probably for me is the biggest thing that I've had to like kind of deal with is instead of just walking into an office every day or a school every day and going, I'm here, let me start working. It's a case of going in and, and saying, okay, this is what we can do. Going away, writing a proposal, coming back, changing the proposal, going back again. <laughs> And so I think there's that whole... Creating that yeah. buy-in. Yes, absolutely. And especially, I'm so passionate about it and I feel that it's so necessary in all schools because of just the way the world is. I, I'm like, but of course you need it. Like, how can you not realise that you need it? And so that's, you know, that, that's really hard. It does what it says in its yeah. tin. Why should I have to explain it? <laughs> Yeah, oh, and also just I think different ways to explain things to different people, and and you know like different. Obviously, schools have different needs, so again, it's that kind of like making working out what they need and what they actually want, and how you can help them is really important. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of learning curve there. I think that's going to become easier once you've got once as you build up your portfolio. Well, our success stories are this school on this year, this school and that school and that school and that school and that school, and then as time goes by, your portfolio will increase. And once you've got the increased portfolio, you won't have to explain yourself and sell it as it were. You'll have to say, um, <laughs> this is what we do. And these are the schools that are bought into it. So you decide. And suddenly it's going to go back to that thing of, oh, well, those, those, it creates that domino ripple effect. If those schools are doing it, then um, 
why why am I not doing it yeah why are you not doing it exactly hopefully hopefully you never know I might even get some schools from Qatar <laughs> yeah why not just head over you know uh, um and yeah because because once you've dominated your you know the UAE then you can spread out to the Gulf global domination <laughs> world domination same old dream a quote from one of the James Bond films yeah how do you envision the future of education? And I think we answered this, which was, what role would you envision eruption playing? Would you envision eruption um, having a having a hand in all the schools in the region? And, and, and yeah, I think. I mean, to be honest, not that I want to get rid of my own business, but like, I, if other people were doing it as well, like, I just want everybody. Because for me, a lot of it's about safety. It's about awareness. It's about doing things right. And I think, as we said before, there's that there's a requirement we have we have a, like a, a, a need and a requirement to teach our children these things and if we're not doing it then we're doing them a disservice so whether it's my company or another company but schools need to do these things because they need to prepare their students for the future and they need to do it in a safe way um i remember when i first came into teaching the teaching standards they were quite all oh, every student must and so on there was a whole list but there wasn't one for technology and a school can't make a policy on that and expect it not to change because technology is changing, so schools have to keep up uh, with, with those changes. Absolutely, exactly. And I think there's, there is so much that they're being left behind in, and it will take time to catch up. But the longer they wait to catch up, the longer, the even longer it will be before they're actually there. And the more things that will come into play that they'll have to deal with and firefight, whereas actually if we're able just to get on with things and start to embed things and start to build those processes in place, the quicker they'll see transformation and they'll see their staff feeling more confident and their workload reducing and all of these incredible things like, you know, go back to accessibility. There was a report in the UK from the Leo Academy Trust where it showed that there was 11 days saved every year from TAs and LSAs because of the technology was doing so much for those low level things that they would constantly have to do to support they can actually focus 11 extra days on students' actual physical needs to help them with their learning instead of just those things that actually a, tech, a device can do, like that like you just said, text speech, anything like that. They, once they were embedded, all of a sudden they were able to have time back to actually do that one to one support and have some really great, meaningful relationships. And that's giving teaching staff back the most valuable commodity, which is time. And hence the reason why I go, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> um, that's probably what you could start your pitch with, actually. So don't you want your teachers to save time? Don't you want to give your staff time? Because if you can give your staff time, that will help significantly with teacher retention. Because why do teachers leave? Oh, 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 I'm overworked. Oh, I don't get much time in this job, yeah. in this school. Um, oh, I've got to work weekends in this school. If you're able to say, you know, confidently that this initiative will give your staff back time all digital strategies done effect, done properly, followed effectively, will save staff time. And actually, the biggest thing that I find that people pick their ears up and listen to is the fact that it also saves them an absolute fortune. I mean, I was in a school not that long ago, and within 15 minutes, we'd saved 100,000 dirhams. That's £20,000. You know, if we'd sat there for longer, we'd have found more. It was just literally like a quick look through and going, well, why are we using that and that and that when actually we've already got this, so just get rid of those. <laughs> so straight away you go, you're saving money, you're saving time, you've got a more efficient ecosystem. It makes sense. I've only got one more question for you, which was what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs looking to make an impact in the education sector? Oh, interesting. I guess, again, going back to something you said earlier, finding the gap because there are so many people who are doing lots of incredible things. Um, and I guess it's really hard to have a voice out there. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, be passionate about it as well. Don't try and do something that you kind of think, oh, I don't, you know, I want to be, I want to do, I want to have my own business, but I'll just do that. I think if you're going to be doing it properly, because you have to get yourself up out of bed every day and crack on with work and do things, even though, you know, you've had so much pushback that, you have to be really passionate and driven. But I think, you're, like you said earlier, finding that gap is really important because that's what people need. And if there's a need, then people will invest in you.